So my name is Graham Unix Rufinacte. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I'm a, I work in an organization locally called Rural Vermont. I'm also a small farmer in the Marshfield area. Um, Rural Vermont, just to say a brief piece about ourselves, has been around for more than 35 years. We're a farmer, farm worker led, member based, not for profit uh, organization that works through education, organizing, and advocacy to work towards the needs of our agrarian community, and small farms here in Vermont. Um, and we're also connected to these larger movements and efforts working towards these goals nationally through our membership in an organization called the National Family Farm Coalition, and through that in an organization called La Via Campesina, which you'll hear more about tonight, uh, which is part of a larger global movement for food sovereignty, agroecology, human rights, and the rights of the environment. Um, I think the next thing I wanna say is that this event tonight is co-hosted by Rural Vermont, by the um, Caribbean Agroecology Institute, represented by Margarita here, and by this ongoing process um, and group of folks that we're calling right now the Agroecology School Collective, which is a group of organizations and individuals working towards starting a school for agroecology in Vermont, hopefully as part of a larger network of agroecological schools in North America, modeled after agroecological schools existing in other parts of the world and connecting to that movement. And I'm going to give you all briefly a rundown of what, we're, what this evening is going to look like. So we're largely here to learn about, discuss, and share histories and experiences with the peoples and places in the agroecological and liberatory movements of Cuba, the Caribbean, and Latin America. Oh. <laughs> to love our children and one another. Hello, Balam and Willie. And to hear about some particular programs and relationships and exchanges that are established and offer participatory opportunities. Uh, and to share and grow real opportunities for greater solidarity and networks of solidarity and mutual aid. And with that, yeah, please. Um, so, we, have a, we all have valuable voices to share here tonight, and a part of the goal here is to bring all of your voices into this conversation. Um, and as a part of this, we're gonna have a, a few main people I wanna introduce now who are going to um, help bring us through this evening and this work and this agenda. Uh, I'm gonna start by introducing Yorlis Gabriel Luna. Yorlis. Um, <laughs> so Yorlis is here representing the Asociación de Trabajadores del Campo, or the ATC, in Nicaragua, uh, and the Latin American Institute of Agroecology at Ishim Elu, if I pronounced that correctly, uh, in La Via Campesina. Yorlis has been a community organizer and popular educator since she was 12 years old, is an agroecologist, beekeeper, and herbalist. Thank you, Yorlis. Um, Niels McCune. Uh, has supported international delegations of La Via Campesina in visits to Cuba since 2013. He is staff support for La Via Campesina North America uh, and also collaborates with the Institute for Agroecology at the University of Vermont. And then we have Margarita Fernandez, uh, the executive director of the Caribbean Agroecology Institute, Institute or the CAI which is a small nonprofit here in Vermont that catalyzes knowledge exchange, builds capacity and supports transitions to agroecological systems that are resilient to climate change and provide sustainable livelihoods rooted in justice and equality in Cuba and the region, and also coordinates the Cuba-US Agroecology Network. And she might tell us a little bit more about those projects here tonight. Yeah. And again, thank you all for coming. Um, without, uh, with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Yorlis and Niels. Muchas gracias a todos por venir. Eh, vamos a comenzar con un ejercicio. Nos ponemos de pie, por favor. Can everybody stand up? We're going to start with an exercise together. Ah, bueno. Y vamos a estirarnos un poco. Estirar nuestro cuerpo, respirar. Start by stretching a little bit. Stretch your body. Vamos a sentir 
esa conciencia de nuestros pies sobre la tierra, vamos a ir sintiendo nuestra respiración y vamos pasando, tomando conciencia del espacio donde estamos, Being aware of the space that we're in. de los demás, Being aware of one another. la otra edad que tenemos acá. And the others around us. Y movamos los brazos a un lado y al otro que hay frío. Move your arms a little bit because it's cold. <laughs> y ahora sí, vamos a hacer, eh, nos quedamos de pie porque en este tiempo hay mucho trabajo sentado. Entonces nos podamos a, com a compartir. So let's stay standing for a couple minute, more minutes because these days there's so much work that people do sitting down. Y vamos a contar nuestros nombres y por qué en una sola palabra, sí, por qué estamos aquí. En so una palabra. We're going to do a round of saying our names and in only one word why we're here. Eh, Just one word. Soy Jorlis y estoy aquí por esperanza. I'm Jorlis and I'm here for hope. Henry and I'm here for Anti-capitalism. <laughs> watch out. Watch out if you use more. When, what was your word? Anti-capitalism. Anti I'm Didi, and I'm here for Cuba. Uh, Sophia and Connection. Uh, Rocio and Community. Me llamo Fiona y estoy aquí para curiosidad. <laughs> I'm Melissa, I'm here for curiosity. My name is Graham and I am here for connection. My name is Kathy and I'm here for Resilience. My name is Vivian and I'm here because I'm curious. I am Carl, I'm here for community radio. <laughs> <laughs> one, one term, one term. <laughs> You have to tell us either like a, a saying from Vermont or like a, a local joke or something. <laughs> <laughs> or a riddle. Yeah. Someone help me out with um, this saying from Vermont about uh, things that we do to make sure that uh, we are frugal with things. We, we use it up. It out, make it do, do without. Thank you, Molly. <laughs> My name is Carlos, and I'm here because I wonder. Devora, curiosity. My name's Erica, and I'm here for food. My name's Evan, and uh, family. My name is Margarita, and I'm here for making oh, connections. I almost put an extra word in there. Uh -huh. um, my name's Shannon. I'm here to support my colleagues at Rural Vermont and to support our friends from Nicaragua. Thank you so much, Shannon. What should be Shannon's punishment? <laughs> My name is Valerie, and I'm here of uh, solidarity. My name is Elle, and I'm here for my mom. <laughs> my name is Molly, and I'm here for family. My name is Nils, and I'm here for y'all. Bueno, eh, pero hay una persona que se pasó de, de una palabra para allá, ¿verdad? Ah, 
un cuento, una adivinanza. <laughs> you didn't get out of it, sorry. <laughs> so you got to do uh, like a, I don't know, a riddle or a joke oh. or something very Vermont, a Vermont saying, anything oh. that comes to you? Oh, something no. very rural Vermont? <laughs> I don't know what Molly just told me, but it was something about taking my long johns off. <laughs> so I don't have anything good, but I'll think about this, Yorlis. I'll have something by the end. Oh, I've been sad. Perfecto. Entonces vamos a hacer otro ejercicio. No se pueden sentar todavía. Y eh, alguien, una de las palabras que más dijeron fue solidaridad, bueno, fue la, la, una sola vez, pero mucho, cuatro personas hablaron de comunidad y conexión. Y si juntáramos esas dos serían siete personas, que son una parte de la mayoría. So if we connected community and connection, we have seven people. Saying the same thing. Y eh, la comunidad, la conexión, la solidaridad, parten de un tronco común, que es la empatía. That's all part of one idea, which is empathy. Que entendernos más allá de los colores, la forma, los orígenes, la diferencia. Understanding ourselves beyond uh, color, shape, origins. Somos seres humanos. We're human beings. Que si no estaríamos aquí, estaríamos probablemente solos en nuestras casas, eh, sintiéndonos mal, triste o alegre o como sea, pero estamos aquí compartiendo. Por eso vamos a agarrarnos y a, vamos a hacer eh, pareja al que tengamos a la derecha o a la izquierda. Eh, o bueno, aquí, vamos a comenzar aquí. Yo soy una y eh, dos. Uno y dos, uno y dos, vamos a hacerlo. No va a ser pareja, va a ser dos grupos grandes. No va a ser, o sea, el uno y el dos se juntan, al que esté al lado para que no se... Entonces no, vamos a hacerlo por acá. Hacer ocho grupos, ¿no? Sí, vamos... ¿Nueve? ¿Nueve? ¿Cuántos hay? Ajá, que busquen una pareja. Que busquen una pareja que no sea... You're going to find a partner. Hopefully it's not the person who you came here with. <laughs> y le vamos a, lo vamos a mirar a los ojos primero. You're going to take a deep look in their eyes. Por un minuto. Ya están las parejas, ahí se pueden cruzar. Aquí. For about a minute. Y vamos a tratar de sentir... ¿Cómo esa persona se siente? And we're going to try to see if we can feel what the person is feeling. You, two, you guys can be three together. Sí. Mm -hmm. Mirándonos a los ojos. We're looking into each other's eyes and seeing if we can feel what the person is feeling. Y vamos a tratar de adivinar. Entonces tenemos dos minutos para... <laughs> we're try to guess. En una palabra, porque para entendernos hay que hablar corto, vamos a preguntar, ¿te sientes cansado? ¿Te sientes...? Y la otra persona que tiene que responder no, va a decir sí o no. So you can ask the person, do you feel tired? And the other person will say yes or no. You can say, do you feel thrilled, they can say yes or no. You can kind of y ask them with one word, emotions. Are we asking with words or words I think are okay at this point. <laughs> How y'all doing? Need some more time? Ya, al menos alguna pareja hizo, adivinó lo que el otro sentía. So it looks like a, have a, have a, at least a couple pairs been able to guess what the other one's feeling? 
¿Sí o no? Más o menos. If you've been able to guess what the other person is feeling. Más o menos. La segunda parte de este ejercicio, vamos Again. a dos minutos más, si ya adivinaron lo que el otro está sintiendo. If you've already been able to guess what the other person is feeling, some of their emotions. Eh, como yo voy a hacer el ejercicio con él, vení. I'll show you how this is going to look. Eh, The next thing we're going to do is. You feel boring? ¿Te sientes aburrido? Bored. Bored? Bored? No. ¿Te sientes cansado? Do you feel tired? Porque necesitas descanso. ¿Quieres ir a casa? Do you feel like going and resting at home? <risa> la idea es que luego que adivinamos lo que la persona siente, solo mirando los ojos, tratamos de hacer una hipótesis de por qué se siente así. ¿Qué necesidad hay detrás? de esa sensación que él está sintiendo. So when we start to get an idea of what the person's feeling, then we try to create a hypothesis of why the person's feeling. <laughs> <laughs> we try to guess what's, what's making them feel what they're feeling. Vamos a darnos dos minutos más. So take another moment, another Tra minute with your partner. Okay. ¿Por qué te sientes así? Mm -hmm. Y por qué luego, vamos, vamos, va, va con calma, va suave. Ya van a ver después por qué. Ayúdame a repartir el, el, esos papelitos por todos, en todas las mesas. Sí. ¿Cómo vamos? ¿Cómo vamos? ¿Cómo vamos? Ya, volvemos al, al, al círculo grande. Este, nos damos un minuto más para ya ir cerrando y volver a la, al... Does this one work? Yeah. Okay. ¿Cómo se sintieron? How did you feel? <laughs> Ahora, ¿por qué comenzamos con este ejercicio? Vamos a, a mí me, me habíamos acordado el grupo hacer una mística. So, why did we start with this exercise? As a group, we had um, originally planned to do a mística. 
pero la, la mística en los movimientos a veces se cree que es poner las velas y las flores y el simbolismo. Sometimes in, in, in mystics we think it's just about putting flowers and cal can candles. Pero la mística es la vida, es la espiritualidad. But the mystic is life, it's about spirituality. Cómo jalamos nuestra mente y nuestro corazón y nuestro ser completo a este espacio. How do we bring our full selves into this space? Y no, no quedamos como el cuerpo y solo la mente, sino... And, and not be the body separate from the mind. Que eso es el capital, el capital separa todo. And that's what capital does, it separates everything. Entonces, eh, ¿cómo vamos a construir comunidad? So how do we construct or build si community? Si no logramos sentir que detrás de cada rostro... If we don't, uh, if we're not able to understand that behind every face, traemos sentimientos, emociones. We bring feelings, emotions. ¿Cómo logramos ir cambiando esa lógica del capital? How can we start to change that logic of capitalism, of capital? Hasta en nuestros espacios más íntimos comunitarios. Especially in our most intimate spaces of community. Ese era el objetivo del ejercicio. That was the objective of queremos this solidaridad, queremos comunidad. We want solidarity, we want community. ¿Cómo comenzamos a romper el egocentrismo? How, how do we start to break the egocentricism? Y empezamos a ponernos en el, la mente, el corazón y los dolores del otro. And we start to put ourselves in our in minds and our hearts and in each other. Ah, vamos a... a les puse ahí, en las mesas, quiero que abran algunas notas, algunas noticias. So I put some pieces of paper folded up along the tables. I want you to open them up. Y en especial para los que dijeron curiosidad. Especially for hay, those who've said that they were curious. Hay muchas, hay muchas notas sobre, fue del periódico de hoy sobre América Latina. There's different articles from today's uh, various newspapers about news from Latin America. Porque si desde nuestra comunidad, desde nuestra calle, desde nuestros vecinos, so from our communities, from our streets, from our neighborhoods, nos cuesta tener esa empatía. Sometimes it's hard to have that empathy. Que nos mueva a, a la comunidad como a salir, ¿no? Del confort de cada quien por sus problemas, That sino, moves us as community outside of our comfort zones. ¿Cómo vamos a pensar más allá? How are we going to think of the other? De lo que está pasando al sur. That's happening, what's happening in the south. Eh, imposible. It's impossible. Entonces, eh, quisiera que alguien, una o dos personas me compartan, nos compartan ¿Qué ven? ¿Qué sintieron esa, en esa noticia? I'd like one or two people to volunteer to tell us what they feel, what they think in, in reading these newspaper, news articles. Y si no hay voluntario, And if there's no volunteer, vamos a hacerlo con una pelota caliente. We're going to do it with the hot paper Venga. ball. ¿Ya todos leyeron la noticia? Did everyone read something? It's mm -hmm. difficult to have hope when you read something like this. ¿Quién más? ¿Cuál es su noticia? La, la... Oh, ¿son diferentes? Sí. Todas son diferentes. Todas son diferentes. Ah. Mm -hmm. Ok. Es difícil tener esperanza. ¿Alguien más? Someone else? Some comment, some reflection of, of what you're seeing. Everybody's news article is different. Papa, papa. Wyoming, many, many, many immigrants come without green cards work for people who have money and I don't you know when I was working there I was working two jobs living with someone with lots of money and working in a place where we actually had someone cleaning purposely so that she could be paid well and 
part of me by moving there, they were uh, whoever the fee people are who come in and round up all of the people that are hugely necessary in our community and take them away. And people are going, what am I going to do without my house cleaning? What am I going to do without the person that cleans my streets or takes my garbage out? So for me, I don't understand, no comprende, I just don't understand. And I go from a different state and such, and it's similar. And I don't want to blame the people who have money where I used to live. People are creating nonprofits to be able to support these kinds of things that are happening in the country <coughs> and the world. And for me, that is what we need to be doing. And I grew up poor. I grew up trying to find working, just working, farming, doing whatever I could, moved to places that I thought would be good, interesting, and I could find work, winter, summer. And so I'm here, and I came because of resilience. We're all here, we're family. We, I don't care what we look like, where we come from. I don't care if you're green, purple, we work. We support each other, I don't care if you have money or no money. Support everyone, be kind, be gentle, talk to each other. Let's reason things out. So, thank you. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias por compartir. Eh, otra persona, la última persona que quiera compartir qué sintió con la imagen. So, I thought it might make sense to read what it says. <laughs> what I'm responding to. Uh, so mine says, Tesla can't build in northern Mexico if water is scarce, the president says. And I agree with that. There's no water, don't build it. Bueno, lo primero que lo quisiera decir yo a la compañera que está allá es de que que sí, el mundo de hoy es muy complejo, pero no es que hoy es complejo. Toda la historia desde el capitalismo capitalism. se volvió hegemónico, eh, ha traído mucho dolor. That's brought much pain to the working class, to farmers, to indigenous people. But we can't lose hope. We have to be like the bees. When I'm sad and I feel like I have no hope, I go and sit and look at the bees. If you feel like you have no hope, I go and sit and look at the bees. Todas las mañanas haga frío, calor, lluvia. If you lluvia, go and watch the bees every morning, whether it's cold, a, a sunny, trabajar. raining, they go. Y si to fly se pusieran a sentarse, a veces yo me las imagino como que están cansadas, pero siguen, siguen. And sometimes I think maybe they'll sit and not drink, but no, they keep going. They dialogando keep con las flores. Talking Entonces, with the flowers. Que, siento que en la vida nosotros tenemos que buscar ese camino de and cómo dialogar like con la tierra y cómo con los otros en ese momento para others. recuperar la esperanza. That, que no todo está perdido. Por eso estamos aquí todos, porque hope. venimos a ofrecer nuestro corazón. Y no es perdido, por eso estamos aquí todos, porque venimos a ofrecer nuestro corazón. Creo que todos quieren ofrecer su corazón a la compañera o no. And so sí, I think ¿verdad? Todos quieren ofrecer nuestro corazón to our friend. ¿Verdad que sí? Right? Yes. Entonces contestemos así para que le animemos con la energía, <laughs> que no haya vacío. Un aplauso, un aplauso, por favor. ¿Por qué les traje como esas imágenes?
diferente, porque cada uno de ustedes y nosotros mismos todos estamos súper bombardeados de mucha información. So I brought these images today with us because all of us are bombarded by information y, y que and es images. información descontextualizada, it's manipulada, decontextualized information, it's manipulated. ¿Para qué? Para generar precisamente muchas emociones en nosotros. For what? To precisely generate these diverse emotions. Y que más allá de esas noticias o de ese, así como hay un rostro aquí, and more than just hay un rostro news, en cada papelito. Y que el llamado en este espacio es que siempre es más allá de ese rostro, es más allá de that esa noticia. Y es más allá de ese rostro, 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 es de and cada so it's up to us to look in the sub soil de cada noticia de cada idea de of cada every idea, of every comunicación news, of every communication para encontrar como los hilos de verdad y encontrar los hilos de de experiencia threads of truth, the que hay. threads of experiences entonces eh, esa es la mística es el momento donde podríamos ver que más allá hay And so that's the mystica, it's uh, to be able to think about more that beyond here. Y allá, solo para, para seguir con el contexto de la, la compañera, cuando en Nicaragua en los 80 se perdió la revolución, en el 89, 90. So in the late 80s, when in Nicaragua the revolution was... Uh, para mucha gente fue el fin de la historia en Centroamérica was lost for many people it was like the end of history pero para los que nos quedamos para mis padres mis abuelos y para todos but mis for those vecinos, of us who stayed for my parents for my grandparents la historia no acabó ahí the history didn't end there se siguió luchando y la vía campesina el movimiento internacional we kept struggling in the vía campesina the international social movement nació en Nicaragua was born in Nicaragua porque los nicaragüenses llamaron a preguntar a los otros movimientos y ahora qué hacemos, cuál es la vía. Because the Nicaraguans went and asked other social movements and now what do we do? What is the path? What is y, la vía? Y la vía campesina. And the answer la vía campesina. Entonces, the ese, farmer's path. Esa es un poco la historia, por eso no hay que perder, la historia es cíclica y todo cambia. So that's a little bit the story, history is cyclical and things are always changing. Eh, solo para la, la, un poquito de contexto de la importancia de Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela. So a little bit about the context of the importance of Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela. Para los que no conocen mucho, la historia de Latinoamérica gira después de la de independencia española, los últimos 200 años, en torno a eh, la política América para los americanos, ¿no? Hola, hola. So, in the history over the past 200 years since um, after colonialism, um, it's turned towards Latin America for America. Que es la doctrina Monroe. Entonces, todo lo que pasa en los diferentes países tiene mucho que ver con esta doctrina. So, de the Monroe Doctrine is born and much of what happens in Latin America is because of this, this doctrine. ¿Por qué? Porque América Latina, para los gobernantes históricos de, de, del imperialismo estadounidense, ha sido el lugar donde tienen recursos naturales, mano de obra barata y... So, what Latin America has is natural resources, cheap labor. Y eh, esa caravana de inmigrantes que está viniendo, las realidades que se viven allá... And that caravan of migrants that are coming. Son causadas por el modelo económico que se vive. And they're coming because of for the causes of the economic system imposed. Y no from solo de, de, de Estados Unidos, sino de todo el norte global. And not just from the United States, but from all the global north. Y eso no lo que digo no es para que sientan culpa o porque no And fue no son not, ustedes. Not for you to feel guilty because it's not your fault. Es un modelo económico it's basado en el colonialismo. Economic model based on colonialism. Y en la desigualdad y en la, en la de distribución desigual de la riqueza. Porque and aquí ninguno de ustedes tiene un avión privado. Dígame quién tiene un avión por aquí, que lo sacamos. <laughs> Does, do any of you have a private plane? Because <laughs> we're going to ask you to leave if you do. 
Entonces no es una, una, una cuestión de, de, de que todos somos culpables, no, es un it's sistema capitalista con una élite. With an elite. Solo para darle un ejemplo, eh, por ejemplo, en las minas de Centroamérica, lo que las empresas canadienses se llevan so en un día. So one in the mines in Central America, what the Canadian companies take in one day. Es el equivalente a lo que lo, la comunidad saca en 50 años. Is the equivalent of what a community will get in 50 years. Entonces, eh, lo que ha habido es una degradación tan grande de los recursos naturales. So there's been such a huge degradation of our natural resources. Que eh, que viene toda la, la pérdida de la, de la, del trabajo, de las formas de vida. So there's a huge loss of just the way of life. Entonces, eh, esa es una de las formas. Y en toda esta política de América para los americanos, Cuba fue, ha sido y es un bastión que ha dicho no. So in all of this context of this history, Cuba has been a, a bastion, an example of a country that has said no. Eh, si vamos a cometer errores, van a ser nuestros errores. If we're going to make mistakes, there are mistakes. Y eh, eso, desde que Cuba, la revolución cubana, triunfó, jaló la historia latinoamericana al antiimperialismo. So since Cuba and the revolution triumphed, it, it brought... Um, many other countries with it and, and a culture with them. Por eso es tanto odio. And that's why there is so much hate. Porque Cuba fue el primero en hacer reforma, bueno, el segundo después de México en hacer reforma agraria, en cambiar, en dar una idea de cómo se pueden hacer las cosas diferentes. Cuba was the second to do an agrarian reform, to give an idea of how we could do things differently. Y por eso lleva más de cinco, 60 años de bloqueo. And that's why there's more than 60 years of a blockade. Entonces, eh, en este contexto de, de Cuba y de sanciones económicas super crudas para Nicaragua también, para Venezuela, para todo el que diga no. So in this context of cruel sanctions against Cuba, against Nicaragua, against Venezuela, for any country that says no. Eh, urge mucho la solidaridad. It's urgent to have solidarity. Y la solidaridad es empatía. And solidarity is empathy. Porque más allá de, de todo somos seres humanos. Y todas estas sanciones es contra el pueblo, es contra la gente común. Because after everything we're all human beings and really these sanctions are against the people. Entonces le espero en todo esto porque todo no, no es para deprimirnos ni para que nos... Mal. And all of this is not to make us all depressed or to feel bad. No, movemos. Es como en Nicaragua decimos que hay que ser como el sapo, que cuando el sapo se cae en un balde de leche hay que moverse y moverse para And hacer so que. And so it's because it's we have to move. In Nicaragua we say when a frog falls into a bucket of milk they have to move. They have to move. Hasta que la vuelve mantequilla. Until until they make the milk butter. <laughs> Entonces tenemos que movernos. So we have to move. Y en este, eh, en toda esta situación política y económica y social, los movimientos campesinos se siguen activando, se siguen moviendo. So in y all this uh, context, political, economic, social context, the farmer movements keep moving. Y la gente también para para eh, vivir y vivir con alegría. And the people also and to live and to live with happiness. Entonces, este espacio de hoy es para compartirles las experiencias del encuentro en Cuba y ahí ya me voy yo. And so this space is for that to share about um, some of the work we do in Cuba and with that I'm going to stop. <laughs> no, am I I'll just quickly say thank you, Yolis, and thank you, Niels and Margarita, for offering translation for us all. And maybe just a quick interlude. For those who don't know, there's bathrooms, one right in there inside the exit door, there's one there, and there's one on this side as well. I see a hand right there.
It sounds like maybe something we'll, we'll end the event with. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so it sounds like we'll take that recommendation and end the event with a song. And for now, I'm going to, I think, pass it, or Niels, am I passing it to you or to? Sure. All right, pass it over to Niels to give us a little bit more context. Great. Thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> and thank you, Yorlis, for getting into the question of current events, right? You guys have these different snippets of information and, and I think the way that we want to try to frame this evening because the idea is to talk about Cuba but also Latin America is to try to understand a little bit just um, why it's so important to rebuild the the solidarity movement in the United States after what seems like a, a hiatus a while of, of sort of relative silence I've been really impressed by the three weeks that we've been here in Vermont everywhere we've gone people have told me and Yorlis about different kinds of work brigades that they organized from that place in the 1980s to go to Nicaragua and, and do work there. Um, sister sister co-op projects that existed. Uh, an enormous amount of uh, community understanding of the, the principles of solidarity and, and of reaching out to one another as, as people. And so the task that I have tonight is to just share a little bit about what might be um, <clears throat> not so recent news around Latin America, but some of the developments that seem like they're of a lot of importance for people to understand in Vermont. And I guess it, one really good way to start was what you at least mentioned, the, the Monroe Doctrine. This year uh, celebrates 200 years, right? 200 years of the same doctrine of uh, America for the Americans, which is the ironic way of saying America for the United States, right? all of the continent, all of its natural resources. Um, if they happen to be outside of US borders, it doesn't really matter. It just might make their extraction cheaper because they belong to US capitalists, right? That's the idea. And uh, there's actually a, a really good uh, snippet. If we can get internet at some point, we'll show you from the, <clears throat> the head of uh, US South Command, the military, about what Latin America represents today. But it, it's, it's revealing, and it's, and it's also a lot more of the same, right? Of, of seeing the fact that other people have water as water for the United States Strategic Reserve, as seeing um, natural gas and oil as belonging to the United States, as seeing lithium as belonging to the United States. So, for example, just to start a little ways back, <coughs> we talk about the last decade in the 1990s. This is after the Sandinista revolution fell and um, efforts to create sort of a, a, a much, much better country in many countries in a much more fair continent were basically defeated by the end of the 1980s. And so the last decade refers to the neoliberal reforms with structural adjustments, which meant privatizations. It meant the end of pr uh, public education, the end of public health care the end of public water, the end of public electricity. Um, so privatization was also uh, connected to the loss of labor law and environmental law, so the degradation of these laws so that foreign companies could come in and extract um, at a higher rate of return. And that was also connected to the dismantling of all um, tariffs and trade protections. So what this meant is that uh, Latin American countries were sold the myth of sort of free trade and, and competing on the world stage, which in practice meant a, sort of a race to the bottom. And so wages fell and spending power fell and poverty expanded. And one way to tell this story is that um, the 1998 election of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, which was followed um, by a new constitution in Venezuela and then a new constitution in Ecuador, a new constitution in Bolivia, through electoral processes were uh, a very important generational change, meaning fighting through weapons hadn't worked, and so fighting through winning elections was going to be the new strategy to try to bring social reform and, and basic social justice to Latin America. And when Baby Bush went to Panama in uh, 2004, was it, to try to advocate a free trade agreement of the Americas, Latin American leaders said no. And instead, 
they proposed something that was called ALBA, which is the Bolivarian alternative for the Americas. ALBA means sunrise in Spanish. And that idea is it's time to build something fundamentally different that will be about cooperation and not competition and in which we have an agreement not between governments and big business but between our peoples. And so the basis of this was complementarity. Instead of competing around natural resources, we could look for ways to complement one another's strengths. And so in many cases what this meant was um, <clears throat> discount petroleum from Venezuela arriving to all kinds of countries in Latin America without any of the conditions that the United States or uh, major corporations put on access to energy resources. So that these, the, these countries could develop without um, the blackmail that they're accustomed to. It, it also meant um, Cuban doctors traveling around Latin America and attending to the poorest populations in the cities and in the countryside in places where uh, people had never received medical care in the past and being able to you know, fix their cavities and um, Operation Milagro, right, which sent poor people from across Latin America to Cuba for a cataract surgery, allowing them to see, and then after a couple of weeks of recovery, fly back home with no cost. So there were a series of measures which were sort of this vision for an entirely different ethic or within Latin America. Um, and there's a lot of successes to mention of the first decade of the, the 2000s in that sense. The Latin American School of Medicine was founded in, in Havana in, in 2004. And Via Campesina, which is a social movement, which is the, not including government powers, autonomous from all political parties, was also interested in all these progressive changes, right? Was agitating, was radical within those progressive changes. Um, and was able to develop an, an articulation of schools for young people from social movements that connect agroecology, working the land with small farmer futures and, and uh, land reform and processes of political understanding. And so these are called the IALA schools, the Latin American Institute of Agroecology. And so all of these different efforts have contributed to um, an understanding of a second independence, an independence that's based not just on formal sovereignty but on substantial sovereignty, so sovereignty over people's farmlands, their forest lands, their coasts, the minerals under their soils, their seeds, their water. And this kind of sovereignty, which is reflected in some of these new constitutions in Latin America, represents a problem for monopoly capitalism, which is uh, under sort of this, uh, uh, under some pressure, right, since the global financial crisis, and there's been a renewed need for capital to have direct access to land and minerals. And so the, the, there's been a mining expansion, more like an explosion since 2008. There's been what we call land grabs across the continent where um, the wealthy basically figure out how to transfer value towards stock markets by pushing people off of land and using armed guards and, and putting up fences and looking for uh, speculative markets that are interested in, in the real estate for mining or, or other extractive industries. And the United States, of course, has played the role of defending the interests of mining companies, defending the interests of the most predatory kind of capitalism. And unfortunately, that has meant since 2008 with the coup d'etat in Honduras, a series of efforts to overturn democratic processes in Latin America. Um, after the, the coup d'etat of Zelaya in Honduras, there was a, a parliamentary coup d'etat of Fernando Hugo, the, the, um, the uh, liberation theologist president of Paraguay. Then after that, there was a, a coup of Dilma in Brazil uh, an attempted coup in Venezuela. There's been, uh, well, the most recent was the coup d'etat in Bolivia in, in 2019. Oh no, there's another one just last year, a few months ago, the coup d'etat in Peru. And unfortunately, the United States is behind every one of these, right? Um, the State Department immediately endorses the new government. There's all kinds of money opportunities put forward to, 
to talk about um, moving past the political problems, right? And so the, the, Mondo, the Monroe Doctrine is still valid of punishing those who have any sort of independence and favoring those that buy into the line of shifting wealth as quickly as possible towards the north. Um, and in this context, there's the bit of a new wave of electoral victories of the left in Latin America. I think there were eight elections last year, and the left-wing candidate won all of them in Latin America. Um, so from Colombia, which had become a NATO country, Colombia is like the, the, the Israel of the United States in Latin America, um, seven military bases. Colombia has now elected a progressive who used to be a guerrilla fighter and has been a peaceful politician for the last 40 years but has brilliant ideas, Gustavo Petro. There was an election in, in Mexico after many, many years, many generations of not having any progressive presidencies. There's been an election of a, of a center-left government. Uh, Brazil, Lula has come back into power defeating fascism in Brazil. And there's a long ways to go towards defeating fascism in Brazil, but Winning the election was absolutely vital. So there's a real effort to defend women's lives. There's a real effort to defend nature. There's a real effort to defend solidarity and memory. And we, I think, have a role in this effort, um, particularly because of the extraordinary role that the United States has played historically in repressing democratic processes in Latin America and extracting value in creating poverty and then taking advantage of that poverty to declare that there's no democracy there and intervening again. Um, the United States has carried out 469 invasions since its founding and uh, over 250 of those has been, have been since 1990. So the, the predatory nature of the United States towards Latin America is not under debate. But what we do want to talk about is something that's extraordinarily important for absolutely everyone from Latin America. It's one of the things that's the closest to people's hearts um, and one of the things that is the, the most painful, right? And that is the blockade of Cuba. Cuba is, is uh, something that if you speak to people in Latin America, there's an extraordinary amount of love towards Cuba an extraordinary amount of love. And if you go to Cuba, there is an extraordinary amount of love for the world. Uh, I was a student there. It's somewhere that it uh, makes one scratch one's head about how, how it is that there can be so much love towards humanity and so much hope in a situation that is really painful, right? Which has to do with the, the economic blockade of Cuba that's, that John F. Kennedy started and has continued to this day. So we're going to move into more specifics, but that's a little bit of a, an overall framework to try to understand what we want to talk about tonight. Thanks. No. Um, so I'm trying to think as I listen to Jorlis and Nils and just such such an incredible background and you know exercise to get us in the mood and and context about the history and the role of the United States. And so I'm sitting here thinking of all the different things that I wanna bring to, to all of you. Um, you know, I don't think I'm gonna, I was planning on talking about what my organization does. And I think I'd rather get more to what we can do together. Um, so I'm gonna briefly talk about what we do just because some of what we can do as a community it could be through our organization. So um, the Caribbean Agroecology Institute has been working in Cuba since 2008, and I personally have been working there since the late 90s. Um, and one of the sort of main things we've been doing was sparked during the normalization of relations moment of Cuba and the United States. So. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with what happened in 2014. So Obama and Raul 
there was a bunch of back channel negotiations around lifting the sanctions and um, the Pope was involved and you know a lot of different negotiations in Canada and eventually it was a it was a prisoner swap so Alan Gross was in Havana he had been there um, in Cuba and prisoned for a few years and the five heroes from Cuba who were in Florida um, some of them from up to 20 years. So anyway, the prisoner swap happened, and then both Raul and Obama announced on the same day, December 17th, that normalization of relations would begin. Um, and so, of course, this was just, everybody was surprised, everybody who worked in Cuba, who lived in Cuba, I mean, nobody saw this really coming. And it was just celebration in the streets. It was like, finally, there is hope that this is going to end. And shortly after that, and we, we had just really begun um, working more deeply with the agroecology and environmental movements in Cuba, and it was just a tsunami of interest from people in the United States wanting to get engaged with Cuba, including big ag, including big companies. Um, and so this group called the U.S. Agriculture Coalition for Cuba was formed, um, headed up by a representative from Cargill. And so then amongst sort of people in the United States who are working towards agroecology and food justice um, came together and said, we need to have a counterpoint to this group. And so we formed the Cuba-US Agroecology Network um, really to show Cuba that there is a group within the United States that is against big ag, that is fighting for change in our own country, and we wanna be in solidarity with you as a leader in the agroecology movement globally, and um, work together to promote exchanges, to channel resources to your work. And so that's what we've been um, working on since then, since 2015. And so every two years, one of the things we do that I work closely with Nils on is uh, the, small, the National Association of Small Farmers of Cuba, which is a member of La Via Campesina, organizes every two years a um, agroecology encounter. And we organize delegations from the United States, mostly farmers, but also academics and NGO representatives who go down and spend a week with, um, with farmers in Cuba, learning from them, really building relationships with them, and it's an incredible experience. I know, how many of you in the room have been to that event? So a few of you. Anybody who's interested, please contact me or Nils. We um, organize delegations, usually it's every two years, but now actually they're switching it to every year. So for this year, it's going to be in October, I believe the 22nd through the 27th. Um, but you can write to rural Vermont or to us and, and we can get you the information soon. We'll be advertising about it. But that's one of the ways that, um, you know, we try and show solidarity and have this sort of people to people exchange and building relationships, which is so important for US Cuba relations be between our, our peoples. Um, and let me think about what else I wanted to share. We also are, since, you know, Cuba is going through one of the most difficult economic crises of their history right now um, because of a whole confluence of factors. So, you know, after the Obama years of um, putting in several measures in place to make things easier for Cuba and for Cuba US relations, Trump comes into power and puts in more than 240 measures, which has completely strangled the economy, including putting them on the state uh, sponsor of terrorism list, which he did right before he left office in January 20, whatever it was that he left office. And what that really does is it prevents Cuba from doing any bank tra banking transactions with any country in the world, or extremely difficult. And so it just has made their economic situation um, very hard for, for the Cuban people. I mean, that's what Yorlis was saying earlier, is sanctions don't really affect governments as much as they do the people of those countries. And so there's been a major migration crisis in the past year. I think it's 250,000 Cubans have left the country, which is like 1% of the population. Um, it's a brain drain. You know, it's mostly the young, the people who have more access to um, to money, to remittances, to family who live abroad. So it's, um, it's draining the country of, of their best resources, their, their people. Um, 
And you know, the list goes on and on of just the tragedies over the past year. There was um, you know, a hurricane in September that then blew out the whole electrical system across the country. There are rolling blackouts that have been happening all year. Just this past week, there were three national blackouts. Um, the entire country without electricity. And you know, after 12 hours, they get it up again, and then it goes down again. And it's just the electrical system is, hasn't been um, maintained for many years, and so they're working on that, and that's because of the sanctions, because they don't have access to the equipment and to the support to, to build their infrastructure. Um, there was a lightning strike that hit one of their main oil tankers off the coast in August, I believe it was, or July. And so they lost several million dollars of their oil reserves, which then also contributes to the energy crisis. So it's just a long list of terrible things that have happened over the past year. But then, you know, along that, um, just the, the sort of unleashed potential of this incredible country, they have a national climate change policy called Tarea Vida, which is one of the most progressive climate policies in the world. Um, they passed a new constitution several years ago that um, mentions the climate crisis and the right to food, and so has all of these incredible things in this new constitution that went through this very long uh, participatory process of engagement with the population to give feedback to the constitution um, until it was, it was passed, I believe it was in 2020. And they just passed two years ago a national plan for food sovereignty and nutritional education, and along with that, a food sovereignty law and an agroecology law that will be coming out in a few months. So um, just a number of these policies that are very progressive, that are around decentralizing power and, and really trying to create a more sustainable and prosperous Cuba. So we engage with um, researchers and farmers in Cuba to help support them as leaders of their change that they want to see in their country. Um, and one of the things that, that we have been um, doing recently, be especially sparked by the hurricane, was developing a solidarity fund and like hurricane relief fund. So if any of you are interested in contributing to that, um, I think actually Molly had printed out a QR code that you can take a picture of to, to donate to. Is it? And so what we did, um, actually two things. When we did the encounter in, in November, beforehand, me and Nils were talking with the National Association of Small Farmers saying we really wanted to support them and bring a donation. So the 80 or so people that came in the delegation, everybody brought like bags of seeds and tools and toiletries and medicines. And it was actually the first time that we brought a big donation to give to the farming families there. So it was a beautiful, um, you know, muestra, how do you say, uh, show of solidarity and love to, to our partners there. And then we also raised funds and purchased $10,000 worth of, um, of tejas, uh, roofs and beds for the families in Pinal del Rio that had lost their homes in the hurricane. And so, so now because, you know, given the fact that hurricanes are going to continue to come and the economic crisis is so deep, we've, you know, set up this solidarity fund to continue to, to provide support to, to partners in Cuba. Um, and then, I think finally is around pushing for policy change here in the United States. And you know, Biden has not done very much um, since he, I think he was waiting for the midterm elections to pass and see, you know, he had to appease to the Cuban Americans in Florida. It's really the Cuban Americans that are holding hostage this, this policy. Um, and so now that that's happened, there seems to be more of, a, of hope and opening for him to actually make some change. In next month, March 15th and 16th, there's a national campaign that some solidarity groups are organizing to call the White House to ask for uh, taking Cuba off of the state sponsor of terrorism list. So we can share that with all of you. If you've signed up on the, um, on the shared your emails on the list, then through rural Vermont, we can share that campaign. And, um, and certainly there will be opportunities for signing onto letters and I imagine in the next few months there's going to be a lot more movement around pushing Biden to make some change. 
I don't know. Oh, the clipboard's over there. Yeah. And so I think that's all I'm going to share now, unless I forgot anything. But I really want to hear from all of you also any ideas or questions or how you would want to get engaged or um, what you've done in the past, if you've been to Cuba, and yeah, just open it up to, to you all. Um, so I'm really interested about Biden's new policy. So just recently, he opened up um, visas, and people from Cuba can come here now for the first time, like um, from Nicaragua, Cuba, and what Haiti. Yeah. yeah. So that's something. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. Um, and I know you said that he didn't, he hasn't really done anything, but um, when Obama was working with uh, Raul in 2014, one of the things he did was take away the amnesty policy from the Clinton administration, wet foot, dry foot. And when Trump reversed all the other stuff, he left that one in place. So Cubans haven't had any kind of like amnesty policy in this country since then. And so this is kind of a huge big deal. So if you, you can sponsor somebody now from Cuba to come here, um, you just have to like pay for their plane ticket if they have a place to be um, and you're responsible for them for just two years unlike the you know like immigration where you're responsible for them until citizenship um, and it's a fairly easy process from my understanding um, and so that's something I'm looking, like I'm trying to do um, right now. Like I don't make enough money to sponsor somebody, but you can combine incomes to sponsor somebody. I'm looking for like an organization that houses people and can um, have them work. Pretty much everyone I know is Spanish speaking solely. Um, <clears throat> And all, you know, I, so I have friends in Cuba, and then I have Cuban friends living here um, who basically came here as, you know, non-English speakers. But um, I don't know if maybe anybody here knows of any of these, like, jobs or organizations that do house, house people coming here because it's like an amnesty, it's like an amnesty program, not like a a regular um, path to citizenship. Do you know about this program? I know about the program. Um, and I haven't kept, like, I, ha I know, I, I haven't followed the deep analysis behind it, this recent one. Um, what I, and I'm interested in Nils's and Yordis's take on it because it involves Nicaragua also, but, um, you know, it's a tricky situation because it basically is um, is saying it's you know it's it's helping Cubans leave the country, and our work is around supporting Cubans who want to stay in Cuba and build the sovereign country that they've been struggling to do for the past sixty plus years, and. It's not to say I have many Cuban friends who have left the island yeah. and many who are here. So uh, my take on it is that these are very personal individual choices. Um, and so, so I, our organization does not have any program like that because we, we work in Cuba and, and not with Cubans who are immigrating to the United States. Um, so. <laughs> medicine and these sort of things, but that's very new, and that's because the economy is sort of crashing in on them. I mean, you could always bring in medicine to Cuba. Very limited me amounts of medicine. Like when I used to travel, they would just go for if you had like a price tag on something, they would charge you. For it is easier to bring in. The, the Cuban government has lifted the limits of things that you can bring in. Yeah. You could bring in larger quantities if you had a partnership with a Cuban organization who was going to be
taking it, whether it be a, a civil society organization or a government organization, and you had that partnership set up, then, then you could bring in larger amounts. But as an individual, they were had smaller yes, and then quantities. Now we're able to just send Send stuff and send medicine and send money and that kind of thing. So I know that the government is a lot more lenient with that kind of thing, but I also know that, you know, like, you, you manage to find things like to buy roofing supplies, but like, you know, when they know how to can access roofing supplies or can find building supplies. On the island. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, the scarcity is, is huge. Yeah, and so it's almost like, when you like, you have to be connected with organizations yeah. to do that. Well, I mean, that's a different question then. Um, then sponsoring people to come in, so getting resources to Cuba. Um, that yeah, we the way we've done that is through through third countries because there aren't you know enough like beds or roofs in Cuba. There isn't like a man manufacturing place there, so it's usually brought in from from Panama, from Mexico, or from the United States. But that's what your organization is doing, is like bringing things in to keep things on the island, whereas, you know, when people are trying to leave, it's because of the, the scarcity of what's on the island. Are you, you're trying to, um, are you trying to bring like those sort of things to the island? I mean, if they don't have, you're, you're working specifically with farmers, is that what's... The material, so that material donation, that yeah. one was for hurricane relief. Yeah. Um, and other types of donations that we've done have been material things for farmers and for projects that we're collaborating with. So it could be seeds, tools, um, we did a tractor, um, we did solar panels, we did irrigation system, we did, you know, chainsaws, uh, leaf mulchers, you know, wheelbarrows, like, uh, you know, a whole slew of materials for, for farming, for farmers. Yeah. Yeah, just to add that there's, it gets pretty nasty when you look into U.S. policy towards Cuba and when you if any of you have ever spoken to U.S. officials about Cuba, there's so much hatred coming out of them that it's it's um, it's really terrifying. You just want to run, right? Um, but part of this change in the end of the wet foot, dry foot policy, right? The, the law had basically said any Cuban who gets to U.S. soil by any means is on the path towards permanent residency, and so. The U.S. has been trying to provoke a, migra a migration crisis from Cuba for decades. And since the pandemic, uh, that policy has become successful in a way that had, had never been successful in the past. And so there's actually like hundreds of thousands of Cubans leaving um, by any means they can right now. And that it's, it's a, you know, it's their brightest, youngest, most hardworking people who are leaving because they're not getting what they need. And it's, it's a tragedy for Cuba. Um, it's a big boon for um, the architects of U.S. foreign policy who are really excited about it. The, the State Department is absolutely thrilled. Jake Sullivan is absolutely thrilled. And one of the things that has changed since the wet foot, dry foot policy is no longer in place is that Cubans who do come to the United States illegally get a deportation hearing, but it's set for about two years after they arrive. And to avoid going back to Cuba, they have to show that they would be uh, potentially under threat for political uh, repression if they were to go back. In other words, they have to participate in the social media campaign to defame Cuba. Um, and so what this means is that people who are living in Cuba and somebody from their block leaves or a friend from high school leaves, then they see this person on social media as part of the U.S. sponsored campaigns to ridicule, to make fun of, to demolish Cuba um, in, on, on the networks. And so that's part of sort of the praxis of the United States, right, is to demoralize and destroy um, Cuban resilience. And it's, you know, it hasn't worked for decades. Right now it's working pretty well in this moment. 
Um, it might not work forever, but also the Cuban Revolution might not last forever. So it's a difficult, very, very difficult moment for Cuba. Um, and there's been a combination of factors. There was a refinery fire that destroyed a lot of um, Cuba's capacity to store fuel oil, to, to have electricity, to provide electricity for the population. There was a hurricane last year, um, the pandemic, and before that there was a reunification of the, the currency, which led to uh, uh, an inflation crisis. So the economic crisis is very real. And um, the policy to undermine and destroy Cuba's so uh, sovereignty is very, very real as well. Are there people who, oh, I see Didi's hand. And I love, this is an opportunity, like any experiences you've had, any questions, thoughts? Yeah, um, I just want to speak to, um, I've been to Cuba twice, and the first time was when this guy was running around like that in Cuba. Uh, <laughs> and we went, um, we went without any program, which I just wanted to see, a, you know, a, con a country that had succeeded in its revolution before it failed. Was my interest in going, and um, it was interesting because I, you know, we called the State Department and said, "Can we go?" And they said, "You can go." And I said, Do, "I said, can I bring my son? You know, I'm going for research. Can I bring my son because he's still nursing?" And they said, "Well, you can bring him." And I said. Can can you give me a piece of paper saying that? No. <laughs> you know, so, so it's like, all right, whatever. You know, so we, we went through Canada. And, um, um, and for me, that trip um, was just a complete game changer in my suddenly being able to see capitalism in my own brain, you know, like, to, and we weren't even there for that long. We were there maybe 10 days or so. And to spend 10 days where there was really nothing to buy, and this was in nine, uh, 98, so it was during the special period, like really hard. You know, I was, I, went, I had lived in New York. I was like, oh yeah, we're gonna have like, you know, I had had all these things I wanted to eat there. And it was like, no, it was like hot dogs and spam and that was it, you know, and um, so, but the the generosity of the people we stayed with, um, you know, we stayed with like family of friends of friends, um, and I'm at that point was a holistic health care provider and found these clinics that were just unbelievable, uh, you know, what they were doing, um, like the clinic in Matanzas that had like 50 different practi practitioners of every kind of alternative um, and, but just, I'm just, we'll never forget that feeling for the next, especially few years after that of coming home and being able to see capitalism in a way that I couldn't see when I'm swimming in it when, and had never been out of it. Um, so, yeah, I just have a huge love for, for the country and I just want to express that part. There's lots more I could say from my head, but I wanted to say that from my heart. I guess I have a question for you two. Uh, I went to Cuba twice, um, actually during the Trump administration, just bringing my kids there as a vacation, uh, vacation. <laughs> and uh, met some uh, family and became very good friends with the family and we are in close contact and I used to be able to send things down to them. We went and traveled again to visit them for a 10 day period um, and then it seemed like from the pandemic on they stopped allowing us to send packages down there, just you know, simple things. And I call the post office and they say, nope, you still can't send to Cuba. You were saying that you send lots of things down there recently. It's a very tricky little connection. I have, yeah, it's. Yeah, it costs me a fortune and it's tricky. And, you know, I had to find all these different 
Like, I know a guy who works at the Miami airport who flies packages to Santiago, and then they pick them up, and I pay, you know, here to send it to Miami, and then I pay, depending on if it's medicine or clothing or whatever, by the, you know, kilo or whatever, and then they send it from there. So it's a, it's a process. So is it going to change? You know, when... When I first started going to Cuba, which was like 10 years ago, um, it would take three, four months for a letter to get there. So, you know, yeah, it's it it's, it's, it's changed. Everything has changed from 10 years ago yeah, to now. I can't even give them my pack. I'm like, I can't go to the post office and give them. No. no. Yeah, you can send anything um, to Cuba. You can send through, um, there's a number of places in Florida like you can't send stuff that you buy here but you can buy stuff online and oh. they send it so a lot of different things food medicine yeah. um air conditioners like a lot there's i can share a couple of the that would be great and just, you know, but you can't send your own like you know knitted scarf oh, yeah. to them i used to be able to though <laughs> uh, unless it's just for people yeah people who go down and I'm surprised that the post uh, worked though, because it did before. That has like come and gone over the years, just as like working and then not working and working and not working. So I'm surprised it worked so recently. I, I no, it, I mean for me it hasn't worked since the pandemic. It seemed like they stopped it, and then I kept expecting things to open up again. And I keep calling, and they say no. You know, Cuba's still on lockdown, like, and I know they're struggling. Yeah. And I'd love to help them, but I don't know how. Yeah, there's a number of companies in, in Florida that Great. You can buy online. And stuff. Perfect. I see Evan's hand. I know we're after 8 o'clock, so we can get a few more experiences and shares. and. Um, thanks so much for what you all have shared. I would love to hear a bit about where you stand with regards to Cuba's government. Part of my narrative as an American was growing up was all about their lack of First Amendment and the potential authoritarian nature of things there. When I traveled there, I was expecting to kind of have that disproven, but I think in some ways it was kind of affirmed by my experience, some, you know, lack of dissent or lack of possibility for that there. So I'd love to hear, it sounds like maybe there's some decentralization of power going on, but I'd love to hear how things are with that and how your organizations relate to it, because I find myself feeling in full solidarity with the people there, but also some complexity around the government being a representation of the people and the extent to which that organism can actually respond to its people and change. And um, if you're just willing to speak on that a little bit, I'd appreciate it. I think it's a good question. Um, the, <clears throat> there's a, there's some of the I think that some of the bases, the, some of the bases on which the the Cuban Revolution represented an immediate emancipation for a vast majority of Cuba's people, but not all of them. Um, in 1959, belonged to a world of the past, right? Some of those bases. So, for example, um, while it's fair to say that the Cuban Revolution represented an immediate emancipation for people of color in Cuba and for women in Cuba. It did not represent the same thing for uh, the LGBT community, right? And that was actually something that happened years and years later. And part of the narrative around the Cuban Revolution is really to focus on sort of its immediate and uh, all-embracing positive impact. And I think that as people who are part of the Cuban process and who visit and, and um, in dialogue with, with Cubans who are there, there's, there's clearly an understanding that, for example, the, the ecological component was almost not present until 1990, right? Um, and so understanding it more as a process, right? And as a process where there's um, the, the first premise of the process is that it has to keep existing to, if it's going to continue to do anything, 
and to exist uh, has been to put unity above some some kinds of dialogue. So, like for example, the 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 formula that Fidel Castro said, which was within the revolution, anything goes, anything you want to talk about, right? Any any problem, any contradiction, but if it's outside of the revolution, nothing, right? So the idea of how do we make the change that we want part of a revolutionary process within a revolution. And I think that um, what they now say in Cuba is that there's a majority of people who support the revolution, not everyone. Um, and I remember around 2008, a big effort to sort of foment dissenting opinions and to create sort of a, like an op-ed section of the grandma newspaper where people could write in. And there's been more and more and more of that. So people can complain about power outages, can complain about um, corrupt officials. There's a lot more sort of um, space for sort of whistleblowing kinds of work. And there's also sort of the argument that, um, there's two arguments. One is that if the U.S. would stop um, undermining the process, then there would be more First Amendment kind of rights opening. And the second is that um, there is a fundamental belief in uh, human rights being social in nature and not individual in nature. So that was kind of the, the idea level discussion that the Cuban government proposed at the time of this signing of an agreement of sort of an end to the hostilities at the end of 2014 would be let's get in a big debate with the United States about the difference between social rights and individual rights. And that debate never happened, right? The blockade was never lifted and Donald Trump was elected. So I, I do hear what you're saying. There's, there's like definitely within ANAP, the Cuban small farmer movement, you're not gonna find somebody who's um, against the Cuban revolution. You won't. Um, but well, I, arriving there as a student, I was actually felt like I met more diversity of opinions than I had ever found in the United States in terms of politics. Like people were all over from libertarians to, to um, you know, people who felt like the revolution had never met its promise to, to those who were more orthodox party line. There was just an extraordinary amount of articulate and diverse voices that I ran into right away as a student in Cuba. So I, it kinda, I think it depends where you look, but it's also, there's certainly like a, there's a big emphasis on unity and there, that le can lead to a lack of conversation for sure. Sí, yo, mira, desde mi experiencia, yo que vengo de Nicaragua y que estudié en Cuba y viví allá, cuando yo estudié allá, solo donde yo vivía, éramos más de 100 naciones. So she said, I, I grew up in Nicaragua, but I studied in, in Cuba, and, and when I arrived to the, the dormitories, there were students from over 100 countries. Éramos de toda África, toda América Latina, y... Éramos gente de barrio, gente de las clases populares, gente pobre, de la clase trabajadora. So there were people from every country of Africa and Latin America, and what we all had in common is that we came from the popular classes, the, the poor neighborhoods. Y ahí podíamos entender que lo que pasa en, que la historia del Congo es la misma historia que Brasil, es la misma historia que el sur global, O sea, esto no, lo, no se puede ver si no se entiende que hay un conflicto colonial muy enraizado en la mente de todos entre el norte y el sur. What's hard to, it would be hard for anyone to understand this if they don't see that there's a, a colonial conflict that's very um, rooted in the north-south relationship. And so when we were there and we saw that the story of Congo is the same as the story of Brazil, that was very powerful for us. Y eh, que Cuba, el odio y la desinformación que hay alrededor de Cuba, es porque Cuba cambió eh, totalmente la historia 
de América y del sur global, las independencias de África no fueran posibles sin Cuba. And uh, the, the enormous hatred around Cuba and the disinformation around it is because of Cuba's disproportionate role in, hu in human history, because there's many um, independent struggles in Africa that were successful thanks to Cuban support. Y esto te lo digo para decirte lo siguiente, que eh, parte de ese rol colonial y la desinformación que hay eh, que influye en todo, es que en esa, en esa residencia donde vivíamos, todos los jóvenes cubanos que estudiaban gratis en la universidad, que todos hablaban inglés y francés ya a los 18 años, que todos tenían casa digna, en ese momento, hace varios años, hace más de 15, 15 años, eran opositores a, a, al gobierno cubano. Y todos los que veníamos de los barrios del sur global, Amamos Cuba. So what we found in, in our dorms was that all of the, the Cuban youth who had gone to school for free their whole lives and had a full, full ride scholarship at the university and all of them who had dignified housing and who um, had, had already learned you know, to play the violin and speak French, they were opposition to the Cuban government. And all of us who came from other countries, from poor neighborhoods, we felt like we had arrived at a paradise. ¿Y qué pasaba? Pasaba de que eh, eh, era ese contexto, pero ahora lo, lo, lo que te quiero decir con el colonialismo es que cuando se, me recuerdo cuando se dio la invasión a Libia y estábamos como 20 naciones, estábamos comiendo en el comedor de la universidad y sale la noticia que el norte global con la OTAN invade porque quieren petróleo y nos paramos varios, y hay varias, varias estudiantes de Alemania, y dicen, es que nosotros tenemos que defender a, a Libia. Bueno. Y nos paramos los latinoamericanos y decimos, déjenlo a ellos hacer lo que ellos quieran hacer. Porque hay un principio internacional, un derecho que se llama libre determinación de los pueblos, que cada quien hace lo que siente y cree que es conveniente y I'll ahí es an, la violación. I'll give you an example of this. The day that NATO invaded Libya, I was in the in the um, dining hall and there was people from about 15 countries there. And so the there was a, a pair of German students who got up and said, "Look, this is for the good of the Libyan people. This invasion is necessary." And the Latin Americans stood up and said, "Look, there's something that's called um, free and sovereign will of the peoples or uh, self-determination, right? And so there's no justification for, for NATO to invade Libya. Y lo mismo pasa con mucha gente que puedas hablar. Eh, no tenemos, yo no puedo llegar a tu casa y decir, limpia así, así así, así así. No puedo. Es un derecho universal. Y lo mismo eh, el, el que, por ejemplo, en Nicaragua. I, hace, can't get, I can't go into your home and tell you how to clean your house. Entonces, eh, mo, hablar y, y contar desde ese otro lado, que es una crueldad que solo por el poder imperialista que le ha dado la carrera armamentista a Estados Unidos sobre el sistema financiero, podás crear tanto dolor en los pueblos. Mira, en Nicaragua, hace tres años, cuatro años que no estaban las sanciones económicas. So, I think the, the point is that you, you can't base... Uh, rights and, and universal rights on, um, on military power. Y que está vinculado al poder financiero y que hace un bloqueo económico y financiero muy brutal. Y, por ejemplo, en Nicaragua, hace cuatro años que empezaron las sanciones súper fuertes, tú podías mandar dinero a cualquier parte de Nicaragua y pagabas como dos dólares por cada cien. Ahora, si tú quieres mandar dinero a Nicaragua, paga 28 dólares por cada 100. So, for example, the remittances that, that uh, migrants send to Nicaragua, since four years ago when the United States put sanctions on Nicaragua, um, you're, you've, people have gone from paying like um, half a percent on what they send to Nicaragua to paying something like 12 percent. So it's, it's cuts in enormously on on how people can support their families. 
Entonces, eh, eh, el, 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 es así lo que está pasando. Creas la crisis y más allá que estés a favor o en contra del gobierno o que estés, es eh, respetar al pueblo y estar en solidaridad con ese pueblo. Que cada pueblo es como la familia del mundo, como cada uno de nuestra familia. So, uh, imperialist power works that way, where they try to uh, name a contradiction within a revolutionary process and then force that contradiction to exist through economic and military means. And so, the, the fundamental part that we can take away from that is that Cubans have the right to determine their own free speech movement. It's not, the US, it's not a U.S. free speech movement in Cuba, it's their free speech movement. Y reconocer eso. Perdón. Would it make sense in that context to take away the blockade then? Just to see if that of had any good impact? Be, absolutely. There should not Seems be. like that's more our role is what we're trying to well, say. tell you is that it is a centrally planned economy. So you're not allowed to leave. You are allowed to leave. It's just that people might not have the resources to purchase a ticket to leave. And it's because on a plane It depends who you are. It depends where you're going. Cubans can fly to Nicaragua without a visa. Yes, they can now. It, there's so no in the 1990s, in the 1990s, right, you need you to get a, 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 a Yes, in the 1990s, it was very difficult to be in the country. Today, anybody can leave, but people aren't able to because they don't have the resources. There's no money. Yeah. Yeah. There's no money. So that's not because the government's limiting it. Limiting yeah, it. I mean, you have that education. And like you said, like you're given this education and you're given you know, books and you have all this stuff. That those people want to explore the world. They want they want that. They, they learn, like, I have this, but I have no money. And, and in the United States, we can explore the world. But we have no education, we have no health care, we have no oh, I understand both sides of it. I get it. But we're also, saying, we're also free to go to Cuba and be like, oh, this is, this is this nice. And I will say the, um, the richness, the, what the education system, what the revolution has done for the level of education of the people in Cuba, I'm sure you've seen that, right? You can have an I incredible understand. conversation with any person any Cuba on the street. And what that has done, the level of respect for the scientists in the country and their influence on policy, I mean, the climate change policy that they have at a national level is exemplary yeah. for the region. And it's because these politicians, yeah, there are the politicians who are like, you know, 
like are just blockheads, definitely. But I can't understand that because like carbon emissions are crazy because the cars are from you know nineteen fifty nine before well, not compared to nothing to, to build the it. On Earth. Earth. I'm just going to pull it back for a minute because I've, I, it's got, we're getting into like a back and forth. And I think part of what I just heard Neil say as well as part of the truth we're trying to hold here is that this isn't about saying the United States or the Cuban government or those political systems are perfect or are the, the ideal form. We're talking about building bridges of solidarity between the peoples and our places and focusing on what works and what doesn't work, what causes harm and what doesn't cause harm and sharing experiences um, of our, with people in these different places and across these different places. And we're going to have different opinions in different ways. And I think, um, I'm going to say two things real quick because we're, we're a little over and we're going to have to be out here by nine. But let's keep this conversation going for people who want to stay or who are willing to stay for at least a few more minutes. Um, does anyone want to sort of respond or have a time in this sort of dialogue or in to share your experiences to expand this a little bit? Because we just got into a little bit of a particular type of conversation here. I see two. I see Carl and I see Sophia. It's, I mean, sort of related to that. But like in terms of like the whole hiatus and this country versus that country and like who's right, who's wrong, I'm wondering if there's like in terms of Cubans' small farmer movement and like education, if there's any like grassroots projects or pro programs happening to help regenerate the soils down there so that they can start sustaining their own food, so that they can start teaching each other how to come together. Like I understand the capitalism whole part of that, but like for young people, like is there a way that they can be taught how to grow their own food, how to sequester more carbon and not have to deal with the effects of climate change that they're dealing with now. And I know that there's, what Nils is doing is like, and what you're doing is kind of like a project like that, but if there's any more and how they can collaborate with other projects across different regions and so forth, which is kind of like in tandem to, or tangent to what they were talking about, but anyway. Do any of you want to speak directly to that or anybody? In agroecologically, right? Yeah. You're speaking. Yeah. You're focusing on all that. Like, right, and how does that feed? What, what, is the, what is being grown, farmed? What are we right. farming? What does the agroecological movement yeah. look like? What does agriculture look like? In Cuba, I see hand bones hand. We, just, we went down there because, um, so they could teach us about that, Sophia. Because uh, we went down there and met this Japanese ambassador, and the Japanese were like, in, in there investigating how Cuba has made the most amazing agroecological system in the world, because they had to, so it's kind of twisted, right? right? Here's the United States, we smashed the Cuban economy, forced them to reinvent agroecological systems because they had no inputs, and then we went down there like a bunch of tourists on a safari to look at it, right? <laughs> but this irony was not lost on the Cubans, one of the things that they said to us was, we have solidarity with the people of the United States, even if you know the, the US government is a bunch of scumbags, right? And they were very nuanced about that. And, you know, it was a lot of really interesting, heartbreaking uh, political and social conversations. But the reason why we, a bunch of this crew, went down there is because they see agroecological systems that you can't see anywhere on the planet. I'm going to, so we have that question around ag agroecology. Carl, do you want to say your question? Margarita just said, should we gather a few questions and then we can sort of respond to them as a group? Thank you. So I'm curious about what drives policy and policy changes in Cuba. I haven't checked in on Cuba for a while now, but as I understand it, there have been no elections since uh, the revolution. Uh, so people are not, uh, decision makers are not responsible to an electorate. So if there are agroecology um, policies made, if there are uh, climate change policies, progressive climate change policies put into the constitution or passed nationally, wh who makes those decisions? What are the pressures on them to, to do so? So we have questions around political process, around agroecology agri and agriculture in Cuba. Does anyone want to add anything else to this sort of last 
bit of bringing in some questions, Didi. My question is, is sort of a variation on the agroecology question, um, because both times that I've gone, there was a, you know, an extreme lack of food, and at the same time, I hear a lot about the extreme successes in agroecology, and I'm wondering, if, is the food mostly um, going to rural areas so that you don't see so much of it in the supermarket, like, how, or are they just not able yet to provide that much food sovereignty. So what's the relationship between the successes of agroecology and the food shortages there? So. All right, we'll, we'll leave it there because that's three good questions, some interrelated. Do you want to start? You're looking at me. It's this, this question comes up always is this paradox of Cuba's agriculture system because they are this leader in agroecology, but they're in this chronic food crisis. And the simplest answer to that is that it, no matter what type of agricultural system you're trying to implement in a country that is experiencing severe structural and economic crises, systemic crises, you're not gonna be able to be successful with an industrial system or an agroecological system. And so there just isn't the economic structure in place for it to succeed. There's extreme scarcity of everything. You know, some basic things like boots, machetes, you know, small tractors, um, processing equipment. There's a lot of food waste because there isn't refrigeration. Their transportation system is terrible. There's no gas. Um, and you know, it's like sort of goes up and down these fluctuations since the special period. Really before the special period, things were much better because there was this relationship with the socialist bloc, and so there weren't, there weren't these food issues. So it's only since the special period. And as things get better, like in the early 2000s, and then fertilizers and pesticides are brought in, and then you know f the food situation gets a little bit better. Um, so there's, there's a, a complexity of issues there for why they aren't able to produce more and have less food waste. So it, then to these policy changes, the one on the National Plan for Food Sovereignty and Nutritional Education, which was passed two years ago, it's geared towards you know, limiting the importation of food, substituting food imports with increased production on the islands through a decentralization of um, management plans for food production. And so the way that that law that, or that national plan was passed was with uh, participation of 13 different ministries across the islands and like 15 research institutes and like 10 civil society organizations that around a two year process went to communities across the island and gathered input around what do you want your food system to look like? What do you, how do you want to, to have um, changes in access to food. And so collecting through this process then built this plan. And you know, some of our colleagues have been building this plan and drafting the laws. And yeah, that's, that's how these laws have been drafted. It's not by five people at the head of the country. Um, and the same with the climate change law. Um, so that's my brief answer. And I don't know if Nils wants to add anything or. Ayer tuvimos un encuentro justo eh, entre apicultores de Nicaragua y de Cuba y en todo el mundo se están perdiendo las abejas. Eh, hay una crisis muy grande de polinizadores porque las abejas representan el indicador para mí de la transición agroecológica. Yesterday I was in a meeting of... Um, of Cuban and, and Nicaraguan beekeepers having a, a Zoom call together. And as you all know, across the planet, um, pollinators are in crisis, right? Um, there's a, there's a, a colony decline that's rampant, and it, much of it has to do with pesticides. Y fue para nosotros en Nicaragua muy sorprendente porque los apicultores cubanos no tienen este problema. Están más bien con el doble del rendimiento por colmena de miel, eh, que eso es increíble, el doble de cantidad de nido, el doble de todos los indicadores de salud de las colmenas. 
And for us in, on the Nicaraguan side, it was shocking because when we started to talk about the, the indicators of our hives, the, the, the hives in, in Cuba were doing much better. That they were more or less producing twice as much honey and they weren't experiencing the same, the same loss. Um, their queens were in better health. All of the, the indicators that we used to establish sort of the parameters of this crisis in, in bee raising, um, the Cubans were in a vastly better situation. Y pues le digo esto porque ese es como el que combina políticas, o sea, tener abejas sanas o no tener abejas en el campo te indica qué está pasando detrás. Y para nosotros eso fue como, ah, espérate, están trabajando duro para tener paisaje sano, tener... So beyond the, the, the other indicators that some of you might be mentioning, for us, just the, the, the importance of a, a social ecological indicator of that depth in what, what it means to build healthy landscapes meant a, a great deal to us to see that, that, uh, that bees are doing well in Cuba. Maybe that combines a little bit of these questions about economics and, and politics and, and culture. Like give us a little bit of the, the big picture, like how much, how much, how much industrial agriculture, how much uh -huh. sure, so, like educational. Sure, so, uh-huh, okay. So there, there was a, um, there were two agrarian reforms in Cuba in the early 1960s. Actually, one was started in 59 and the other was in 63. And so the first one created a, a massive cooperative sector of small farmers with their own land. And the second one created a state farm sector that started to have a lot of the land and operate it as public companies. And so that vast amount of land that was operated as public companies went into crisis when the Soviet Union fell and it had no access to inputs. And it has never been able to pick itself back up. And that sector had 80% of the land, 80% of the farmland in 1990. The small farming sector, which had at the time less, I think it had like 11 or 12% of the land in 1990, now it's up to maybe like 25% of the land, has been where this big agricultural success has happened. And that's because people had not forgotten their roots in the peasant traditions of, of using oxen to plow the land, of saving seeds, of trading seeds, and of using beneficial plants and uh, a number of agroecological practices that were already in place. And so when that sector sh started to show some promise, it was given s a little bit more space to experiment. And um, they created something called the farmer to farmer movement in Cuba, taking as a model the farmer to farmer movements from Central America. And when that happened, there was an exponential growth in the number of farmers who started to use alternative agriculture practices and who started to talk about agroecology. So now uh, over half of the farms in the country are aware of their own, for the, their, they work their farms in an agroecological transition process. And so some of them still have only a few crops, others have dozens of crops, but um, they understand themselves to be in an agroecological transition process, which means integrating um, livestock with crops, uh, with trees, and creating sometimes very small scale agro industry, right? Producing their own cheese or producing their own guava jam on farm or toasting their own coffee, this kind of thing. Um, and yeah, it's about half of Cuban farms now, which means about 150,000 farms out of 300,000. That's the rural side of uh, agroecology, and Margarita, I think, can tell us about the urban side of agroecology in Cuba. Yeah, I mean, as in response to the special period, um, with the lack of petroleum and the food crisis, there is this social movement burgeoning in response, and so this creation of urban farms, and then the state began to support that. And so, you know, 20, 30 years later, there is a national program for urban and suburban agriculture. And, 
it really changed Cuban's diet because Cuban diet is rice, beans, pork, and then maybe a little bit of tomato or lettuce. And, and so what the, or, or yeah, and, and root crops. But what the urban ag sort of movement did was diversify the diet and bring in a lot more vegetables. Um, and in terms of education, every province has a university and then every municipality has a university center that's connected with that provincial university and there are agricultural programs that, that are training local people about ecological practices and yeah. So there was a request to finish this event with a song and I have not forgotten and it's way over time here. Um, we could probably be talking all night, but can I, I think our people who, who, who were going to lead us in song left. I don't have, I don't have a song. Marguerite doesn't have one here, Lee. No, we'll see who comes back. I don't know any Cuban songs. Or, but um, I will, maybe I'll say, well, your least, did you have something you were thinking of when there was a request for... Um, Eh, Margarita, ¿me puedes ayudar para cerrar? Para antes de que nos vayamos, vamos a hacer un cierre de, de este espacio. Y... Eh, ¿Qué pasó? Nos ponemos de pie, por favor. Vamos a agradecernos a que tengamos a la derecha y a la izquierda por haber venido. We're going to thank, thank ourselves, thank everybody for having come. Y vamos a decirnos una palabra a que tengamos a la derecha y a la izquierda. Vamos a decirnos, aunque tengamos diferencia, te acompaño en tu sueño. So we're going to say to the person to our right and to our left, even though we have differences of opinion, I accompany you in your dreams. Para, para, para mí, crear comunidad es compartir sueños. Entonces, Creating community is sharing dreams. Entonces lo vamos a hacer a las tres. Una, dos, tres. A la derecha, a la izquierda. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we have differences, we share dreams. <laughs> and I lastly just want to say, you know, Margarita didn't speak specifically to some of these programs, but these are really accessible exchange programs um, that they've been running with an op in Cuba, and I encourage people to inquire about them. Really unique opportunities, and she spoke to some fundraising efforts too for mutual aid, and please be in touch if you're interested in any of those things. And thank you all very much. Thank you for bringing food and sharing yourselves. <laughs>